Hi, everybody. Merry Christmas. This is Patriots History. I'm Larry Swigart, co-author of Patriots History of the United States and your host. And it is December 23rd, 2023, my last broadcast before 2024. I will be taking next week off. And so um, I would like to direct you. There's some things I cannot say on YouTube, as you might imagine. They get a little miffy if you say the wrong things. But I would urge you to go over to my wild world of politics today and look at today's news from today and stay till the very end. I have a special message for all of you, and I think most of you will really like it. Okay, let's get started. We are reading from, as always, the 15th anniversary edition of Patriots History. And if you have an earlier edition, the page numbers won't line up, but the headers might. Sometimes we change headers, but not too often. Anyway, I am, we are, um, excuse me, we are in chapter seven, red foxes and bear flags, and I am on page uh, 242. Let me check something real quick. Okay, what I had to check was, is, have I added any material in this for the 20th anniversary edition? And I have not. Uh, but throughout the book, I am reading new material that will be in the 20th anniversary edition. Really what it is, it'll be a PDF of the three corrections we had, pretty minor stuff, and um, numerous editions of new analysis content and uh, sources. Um, not too much changing stuff as it is enhancing and developing stuff. And so I will say insert on page 243 the following paragraph after the paragraph ending and Douglas said no, whatever it is. I'm going to make this available free sometime in the early spring. I'm working out with War Room and Steve Bannon, who's publishing my, um, my book, Patriots History of Globalism on February 20th. So we don't want to step on our own toes here and try to be promoting two things at once. So it'll probably be after March that I will put all this up free on the web. It'll be in a PDF, and all you have to do is click on it, download it, and open it whenever you want. So we are looking at page 242, American Renaissance. Pull my post them off without tearing the page. There we go. All right. Education and the arts also experience great change to the point that some have described Jacksonian high culture as an American renaissance and, quote, a flowering of the arts. Although such language is exaggerated, it is true that America saw its second generation of native intellectuals, writers, and artists achieve bona fide success and recognition during the antebellum years. Now, antebellum, again, is before the Civil War, okay, before the war. Jacksonian writers and artists came into their own, but they did so in a uniquely American way. <clears throat> American educators continued to pursue aims of accessibility and practicality. New England public schools provided near-universal co-ed elementary education thanks to the efforts of Massachusetts State School Superintendent Horace Mann and a troop of spirited educational reformers. Public school teachers, many of them women, taught a pragmatic curriculum stressing the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Of course, today they, they've actually begun to ban that stuff. You don't need math to graduate high school now in some states and some schools. It, it's utterly absurd. It has turned education on its head to where it's no more than propaganda. That's where I, I went from being a advocate for homeschooling to an avowed opponent of public schooling. I once saw some value in public schooling. I see almost no value whatsoever in public schooling right now. Um, perhaps if it was raised and torn down and you started again, it might have some value. But as it now stands in the grip of the teachers unions, mm -mm. okay, Noah Webster's blueback speller textbooks are extensive and nearly universal use as a as teachers adopted Webster's method metal sorry methodolo methodology I'm having trouble today methodology of civics patriotism and secular but moralistic teachings 
The new booster colleges appeared to supplement the elite schools and were derided because their founders often were not educators. They were promoters and entrepreneurs aiming to boost the image of new frontier towns to prospective investors. Illinois College and Transylvania College appeared west of the Appalachians and eventually became respected institutions. Ohio alone boasted nearly three dozen degree-granting institutions during the age of Jackson. And although Ohio's Oberlin College produced excellent scholars and scores of abolitionist radicals, many boomer colleges failed to meet the high standards of, for example, Great Britain's degree-granting colleges, Oxford, Cambridge, and Edinburgh. The arts flourished, along with academics in this renaissance. Beginning in the 1820s and 1830s, northern painters Thomas Coyle, George Ennis, and others painted evocative scenes of New York's Hudson River Valley. Nature painting grew wide praise, and the market developed for the landscape art that spread to all regions. Got to remember, folks, you kids especially, <laughs> you don't get to just sit and paint all day. Now, now I know many people, including the great Rush Limbaugh, said, you know, follow your dream. You know, you want to be successful, do what you love. That's true to an extent. But also to an extent, you do have to eat. Humans do have to eat. You do have to have a house. You have to pay rent or you have to pay a mortgage. You have to have transportation. All this stuff costs money. And if your art does not sell, you will have to find another job and do art on the side. It cannot be your livelihood if you can't make a living doing it. And, and I once had a debate with a friend of mine about whether or not uh, you're a professional um, just because that's all you do. This person was a musician and uh, not particularly successful. And he insisted that he's a professional musician. Well, in terms of what he did all the time, that's absolutely true. Yes, he wrote songs, he played, so on and so forth. But he could not support himself 100% of the time on his music. Uh, have to do part-time jobs and other kinds of things. Um, technically, I am not a professional writer because I do not make my living writing books. I made my living as an educator, mostly in universities. I wrote books on the side, some of which were hugely successful. But to be a professional writer, young people, it's a challenge. Uh, I know a novelist, novelist friend of mine, Brian Freeman, has written dozens and dozens of novels, and they sell. I don't know how much they sell, but he has won award after award, but awards don't put food on the table. Um, but he, I know he's a good writer. Obviously, I love his work. I think it's fantastic. Brian Freeman, some of the great American thriller novels without a lot of language and said they're they're great. But I also know he's great because he was named to take over for Robert Ludlum when Ludlum died to take over the Bourne legacy uh, books, you know, Jason Bourne. And uh, you got to be pretty good to do that. Uh, another fellow I know, Kyle Mills. Uh, was asked to take over the very successful Vince Flynn novels, even though he had many novels of his own at the time. So it's it's a fine line. Yes, we do want you to do what you love. But if what you love isn't paying the bills, you got to be honest with yourself. Then you may have to ask yourself, A, am I as good as I think I am? Is it just that I'm brilliant and nobody else has figured out how great I am? Or is it that your taste may be a little quirky and most people don't like it? Um, you know, I can name you numerous musicians whom I just loved. I thought they were incredible. Yet the public, you know, they never had a number one hit. Most of them never got in the top 10 or 20. Now, why aren't they? Well, because I have weirder tastes than a lot of people. So I, I just want to bring that to your attention. Yes, do what you love, but you also have to be, you know, Jesus said to be shrewd, uh, to be wise. And you're going to have to know when, if what you're doing, what you love, what you're doing, isn't paying the bills and has no hope of doing so in the very near future, 
find a job, get a job, and do what you love on the side. If you really love it, you'll come home at five in the evening, eat, and get to it. So if you like painting, you get home, as soon as you get home, you eat, you're going to go paint. If you love writing, but you aren't selling any books or any articles, you'll come home, you'll eat, you'll start writing. I once asked William F. Buckley Jr., who was the editor of National Review, he edited, he published columns, plus he did at least one novel a year. I said, uh, how do you write so much? And he said, well, I get up in the morning, I brush my teeth, and I sit down at the typewriter. That, he was old school like that, right? So um, anyway, that, that's just a word there about these uh, schools. Uh Nate, and so I, I want to mention nature painting drew wide praise and, and a market developed for their landscape art that spread to all regions. In other words, these paintings were sufficiently popular that these painters could make a living, living with these paintings. And that's why we're also going to see that portrait paintings are, are very popular because rich people wanted to pay to have their portraits done. They didn't have phones with cameras in them at that time. Missouri's George Caleb Bingham, for example, earned acclaim for painting scenes in the Mississippi and Missouri River Valleys, fur trappers, local elections, and his famed Jolly Flatboat. This is a very famous uh, picture. Landscape and genre painters adopted America's unique frontier folkways as a basis for the democratic national art that all Americans, not just the ed educated and the refined, could enjoy. Uh, and this this also, I hate to keep stopping, there's a lot of good stuff here. This also um, becomes kind of an issue with people, young people, as you start to get into your careers, there's going to be critics who want you to do stuff that only the critics like, especially like in filmmaking. Right? We have Rotten Tomatoes, and you'll notice that in Rotten Tomatoes, the score of the critics often is down here, and the score of the public is way up here. That's, that's not to be scoffed at. In fact, you probably ought to go with the score of the public. Nine times out of 10, the public knows far better than the critics what's really good art. And the critics always want something that they think makes them stand out because nobody else likes it, and that's why they like it. Or, or it offends everybody, and that's why they like it. No, no, no. So um, just kind of keep your eyes out on that kind of stuff. James Fenimore Cooper did for literature what the Hudson River School did for painting. A native of an elite upstate New York family, Cooper wandered from his socioeconomic roots to create his literary art. After a childhood spent on the edge of the vanishing New York frontier, Cooper dropped out of Yale College to become a merchant seaman and ultimately a novelist. In The Pioneers, 1823, and Last of the Mohicans, 1826, he masterfully created what we now recognize as the first Western genre novel. During two decades, Cooper wrote a five-book series featuring his hero, Hawkeye, whose name he changed in each book uh, on as age advanced, who fought Indians and wily Frenchmen and battled the wild elements of nature. Hawkeye, a wild and woolly frontiersman, helped to advance the cause of American civilization by assisting army officers, settlers, townspeople, and, of course, damsels in distress. In classic American style, however, Hawkeye also constantly sought to escape the very civilization he had assisted. At the end of every tale, he had moved further into the wilderness until at last, in the prairie in 1827, he died, an old man on the Great Plains, with the civilizations he had both nurtured and feared close at his heels. <clears throat> it's no accident that during the time of the Industrial Revolution, social and political upheaval, America produced a literature that looked back longingly at a vanished and often imagined agrarian utopia. Henry David Thoreau's Walden, or Life in the Woods, 1854, is probably the most famous example of American writers' penchant for nature writing. Thoreau spent nearly two years in the woods, at Walden Pond near Concord, Massachusetts, and organized his evocative Walden narrative around the four seasons of the year. His message was for his readers to shun civilization and urban progress, but unlike Hawkeye, Henry David Thoreau traveled to town periodically for fresh supplies. 
After his two-year stint in the wilderness of Walden Pond, Thoreau returned to his home in Concord and civilization only to land in the town jail for tax evasion. He wrote of this experience and his opposition to slavery and the Mexican-American War in his famed essay, quote, On the Duty of Civil Disobedience, 1849. Although Thoreau's fellow Massachusetts author Nathaniel Hawthorne was not a nature writer, he addressed crucial Jacksonian issues of democracy, individual freedom, religion, feminism, and economic power in his elegantly written novels, The Scarlet Letter, 1850, <clears throat> and The House of the Seven Gables, 1852. Later, Herman Melville produced a dark and powerful view of nature in the form of The Great White Whale of Moby Dick, 1851. How many of you read Moby Dick? I see no hands going up. How many of you have seen Jaws? Jaws is Moby Dick. Basically the same story. Captain Ahab is Captain Quint. Uh, you have a couple of other characters thrown in there, but basically Jaws is the great white whale. And he won't let go of this even to the point that it eventually kills him. Right Now, I've read Moby Dick. It's not a novel I heartily recommend. Has a really interesting start, really good ending, but in between there's a very long and I think fairly boring section on how you do whaling. However, if you're out there really wanting to learn the whale trade, you might want to read Moby Dick. Indeed, some experts point to Melville's and Hawthorne's artful prose to refute Alexis Tocqueville's criticism of the quality of American literature. They note their literary skill and that of their fellow Northeasterners, Henry Wadsworth, Longfellow, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Harry Beecher Stowe, Emily Dickinson, and the Transcendentalist authors as evidence of an accomplished Jacksonian literati. These are all great authors. Um, nobody can stick their nose up at these people. They're, they're great authors. Another school of writers active at the same time as the New Englanders actually proves Tocqueville's politically uh, partially correct. The Southwestern school of newspaper humorists was not as well known as the Northeastern, yet it ultimately produced some of the most famous and uh, some of the most American of all American writers. Mark Twain, the Southwestern writers, uh, Mark Twain, the Southwestern writers are newspaper men residing in the old Southwest. Remember, you got to pay the bills. If you want to write opinion pieces, you better be writing news pieces so you can pay the bills to write your opinion pieces. Southwestern writers are newspaper men residing in the old Southwest, the emergent frontier towns along the banks of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. In Louisville, St. Louis, Natchez, Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, Cincinnati, and New Orleans. Newspapers like James Hall, newspaper men like James Hall, Morgan Neville, and Thomas Bangs Thorpe wrote short prose pieces for newspapers, magazines, and almanacs throughout the Jacksonian era. Once again, I would say that if you want to be an author today, very few people can make it just on books. Certainly to start, you've got to write for magazines, you've got to write short opinion pieces, you've got to write anything that pays. A new entirely American frontier folk hero emerged through the exploits of Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. Although contemporaries thought Boone, quote, lacked the stuff of a human talisman, Instead, Crockett captured the imagination of the public with his stories of shooting, fighting, and gambling, all of which he repeated endlessly while running for public office. Crockett liked a frequent pull on a whiskey bottle, phlegm cutter, or antifogmatic, he called it, and he bought rounds of, for the crowd when campaigning as a wig for Congress. Crockett named his rifle Old Betsy, and he was indeed a master hunter. But he embellished everything in one story, claimed to have killed... 105 bears in one season. He told of how he could kill a raccoon without a bullet by simply grinning it out of the tree. Not one to miss an opportunity to enhance his legend or his wallet, Crockett wrote, with some editorial help, an autobiography, Life and Adventures of Colonel David Crockett of West Tennessee. It became an instant bestseller and far from leaving the author looking like a hick, Cro Crockett's book revealed the country congressman for what he really was, a genuine American character, not a clown. Nearly all the Southwestern tales, like the Western genre they helped to spawn, featured heroes in conflicts that placed them in between nature and civilization. Like Hawkeye, the Southwestern folk hero always found himself 
assisting American civilization by fighting Indians and foreign enemies, and above all, constantly moving west. Crockett's life generated still more romantic revisions after his fabled immigration to Texas, where he died a martyr for American expansion at the Alamo in 1836. Had Crockett lived long enough to make the acquaintance of a young author named Samuel Clemens from Missouri, the two surely would have hit it off, although the Tennessean's life may have surpassed even Mark Twain's ability to exaggerate. In his job as a typesetter and cub reporter for Missouri and Iowa newspapers, Sam Clemens learned his lessons from the Southwestern writers. One day, Clemens, under the nom de plume Mark Twain, would create his own wonderful version of the Western. Speaking the language of the real American heartland, Twain's unlikely hero, Huckleberry Finn, and his friend, the escaped slave Jim, would try to flee civilization and slavery on a raft headed down the mighty Mississippi. Like Twain, Cooper, Thoreau, the Hudson River School, and scores of Jacksonian artists, Huck and Jim sought solace in nature. They aimed to, quote, light out for the territories and avoid being civilized, spelled with an S. Such antipathy for civilization, spelled with an S, marked the last years of Andrew Jackson's tenure. When he stepped down, America was already headed west on a new path toward expansion, growth, and conflict. Ironically, Westerner Jackson handed over the reins to a New Yorker, Martin Van Buren, at a time when the nation's cities had emerged as centers for industry, religion, reform, and politicking. That's a good place to stop. So uh, we will pick back up here after the Christmas break. I will see you back here on January 2nd. Remember, folks, I have great offers. Uh, Black Friday offers are still good through Christmas. Uh, they include Patriots History and Dragon Slayers, Patriots History, uh, the two politically incorrect books I did, and Halsey's Bluff. And a five-book set of Patriots history, Reagan, the American president, Dragon Slayers, um, let's see, Halsey's Bluff, and my book on rock and roll with Mark Stein, You Keep Me Hanging On. And we also have another special that's still buried on the page someplace, the Patriot Package, which is Patriots history and the Patriots history reader. All of these are autographed. Ship them all to you. No, they're not getting there by Christmas. But order now, we can give them to you early in the first part of 2024. And remember, I'm trying to make Patriots history into a full-length film. I need your support. Uh, please go to the site and look for Buy Larry a Coffee. And at five bucks, just buy me a coffee. All these videos are free. I give them all to you free. So help the cause. Support me once in a while by buying me a coffee. Or it's Christmas. Buy me 50. Anyway, I'll see you guys back here on January 2nd.